Hi, everyone. Uh, so first, I'd like to say um, this, this seminar is the Distinguished uh, Seminar in Optimization and Data. It is an interdepartmental and interdisciplinary seminar that uh, we have uh, several distinguished speakers coming each year. Uh, and it's supported by a, a collaboration of different institutes and departments. So it's supported by IFDS, PIMS, Departments of Math, Statistics, Applied Math, ECE, and Computer Science. So thanks to all these uh, departments for supporting the seminar. And today, we are really happy to have our own Lin Shou, uh, because he is local, <laughs> uh, have a VR speaker. Uh, I've known Lin for a long time. We were actually uh, office mates at, in our, during our PhD, working with a group of uh, Professor Stephen Boyd at Stanford. Uh, so Lin got his bachelor's degree uh, from uh, Beijing University of Aeronautics, and then his PhD from Stanford. Uh, then he was a postdoc at Caltech, uh, after which he joined Microsoft Research and was a long-term researcher at Microsoft Research. Um, and recently he has joined uh, Fundamental Research, uh, AI Research Center of Meta, um, uh, which is part of FAIR, uh, here in Seattle. Um, his uh, research is, uh, has been actually very influential over the years. He has won several key awards. One of them is the Young Researcher Prize of the ICC Opt, like Continuous Optimization Conference, in uh, 2004. And uh, oh, also the big one is in 2019, he won the Test of Time Award of the New Rips Conference, which is the biggest machine learning conference. Test of Time Award is actually an award given 10 years after a paper is published, measured by the influence that that had paper had over the decade. So he won it for his work on regularized dual averaging methods. Uh, and yeah, and since then he has been uh, doing a lot of other great work. Today he will talk to us about non-negative Gauss-Newton methods in machine learning. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Marin, for, for the great introduction. And also for the kind of invitation. Um, and it's, I'm really happy to give a talk at UW. Uh, I guess has been a while I didn't visit until, I guess, after the pandemic, this is probably the first <laughs> visit, except attending my son's, you know, <laughs> conversement. <laughs> no, not conversement, just as, uh, he just got uh, as a freshman. Okay, today I'm going to talk about uh, non-negative Gauss-Newton method. This is joint work with Antonio Oviato, who is now actually joined as a, a Alice Institute in Tübingen, also Max Planck Institute. Uh, and uh, this was uh, work when he was at Meta as an intern uh, working with me. Uh, so the work we cons uh, the problem we consider is empirical risk minimization. Is you know this the standard setting for machine learning. You want to minimize. You know actually in machine learning the, the fundamental uh, problem is really want to is a stochastic optimization problem. Here you know for each data. You know, sample z, you would define the loss function f z of x. X is your variable in, in your machine learning model. And you want to really minimize the expectation when z follows a certain distribution. Of course, in reality, we can only do finite sample. That's why we have this sample average approximation, which is this uh, uh, empirical risk minimization problem. And the popular loss functions, of course, include, you know, uh, this linear regression, logistic regression. That's the standard convex loss. And for uh, like training neural, neural networks, I think just make it a little bit more concrete, we have something like this, uh, you know, the input will be an image for, for you know, uh, image classification. You have labels, this is say uh, digit number four. And then you have this neural network, the weight, you know, matrix multiplication is just certain nonlinear rarities. End of the day, you have this kind of uh, 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 10 numbers, y, k, between zero and one, and then you have this uh, cross entropy loss. So, but this is like a non-convex in general in, in terms of the weight matrices of the uh, machine learning model. <laughs> okay, so the most popular algorithm, or maybe the most only viable algorithm for dealing with this large scale, you know, uh, kind of a high dimensional problem is the stochastic gradient method. So you can apply to either the finite or, or expected version uh, and the general form is basically you update your uh, weight matrix, or here I've seen it's just variable x, k, you know, along certain di direction, no negative d of k, and with certain uh, step size gamma k. So for the standard stochastic gradient method, 
BK is basically the uh, staccato gradient. It could be a mini batch uh, average. Uh, here, IK is basically the random you know, uh, index you pick from that uh, finite sum. Uh, of course, then you can have uh, stochastic heavy ball methods and uh, with momentum. And more generally, the adaptive optimizers, uh, which are more popular in you know, the Adagrad, RMS, Problem, and Adam, they do a coordinate wise uh, scaling. You can interpret it as a coordinate wise different step size, or you can interpret it as, um, as a diagonal preconditioner or uh, other interpretations. But then, end of the day, you still probably need, a, a, let's say, a, we call it a, a master step size gamma k to, to control the scaling. So the question, uh, many concerns of this work is how do we choose the step size gamma k? Uh, or in machine learning, people just call it a learning rate. In practice, uh, this is a zoo of learning rate schedule. So how do you work with uh, gamma k? You can start with, uh, you know, step decay, you can do some, uh, you know, linear decay or cosine or annealing or even those uh, cycles. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's really uh, also based on the heuristic and the trend error. The end of goal, uh, end of, uh, the end goal is basically to make a, a generalization performance uh, really well, not necessarily your optimization performance. Sometimes you see some algorithm will give you a very good optimization, you know, a tiny optimization error, but it, it does not work on other new samples. Uh, so this is, you know, has been uh, you know, status of the recent years on the, uh, uh, in practice. But of course, there are more principled methods, methods that based on kind of have a theory support. For example, the, the classical one with uh, uh, polynomial decays, right? And you have to kind of tune the parameters A, B, C. But usually that, you know, involves lots of tuning for each data set or a model, you want to retry the ABC or, or some other ways to do it. Uh, and this we call it a non adapt method, basically ABC, basically it doesn't change the distribution depending on what data you have. And uh, there's early work actually on adaptive sub size, not long after invention or stochastic approximation indeed. They were trying to figure out how do you adapt the step size so that you would just adapt to the current problem, current data, and convert it in the best, uh, most robust way. In recent years, there's also a parameter-free, uh, you know, work. Uh, um, start with online optimization, parameter-free online convex optimization. Actually, there's uh, along similar lines. Uh, more recently, you know, my colleague Aaron DeFazo and his uh, collaborators has the D adaptation work, which just won the uh, one of the outstanding paper award at SML this year. So this is uh, lots of progress on this one. Uh, but lots of the methods are actually based on convex optimization principles. As you, you should see the literature, uh, lots of them rely on the convexity or some other assumptions. But this talk, we actually focus on the you know, um, smooth, but uh, one simple observation is that all the loss functions are indeed uh, non-negative, we assume them non-negative, which is common in machine learning uh, applications. So for, for the rest of the talk, this is the outline of the, for the rest of the talk, you know, we first actually focused on how do we deal with a single non-negative function instead of the finite average. But after that, it will be clear how we do in the average case. And then that will actually make a connection with the polyx step size. And then we discuss about more general versions of the algorithm, which is, you know, like the general proxy linear algorithms. And then we uh, come back to the finite sum or, you know, the empirical risk minimization problem, talk about stochastic uh, non-negative cost newton methods. And then there's some interesting extensions. So let's look at a single function without a structure. I mean, the f could be the whole average, but we don't care in this stage. So it's not negative. But this is really without any loss of generality because we can apply it to any function if we have a non-trivial lower bound, then we can apply it because we just subtract it and they become non-negative function. Subtract it and they become non-negative function. So this is not much uh, loss of generality. So the trick is actually very simple, almost embarrassing. Uh, it's basically, since it's non-negative, you can write it as the square of its square root. And that's, that's 
almost all of into it. <laughs> uh, yeah, of, of course, the original motivation is more than this, but uh, end of the day, we will, the stories can be very short. Is you know, is this? But 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 with C square now, it's, it's already non, non, non trivial because lots of people working in organization knows how to deal with this thing. Is this Gauss Newton idea? So let's see. The basically the Gauss Newton idea when you apply with a, with a single function, basically you want a step size pk, you want to move pk, and is is arc mean of a model of your original uh, uh, squared nonlinear function. Here we we only linearize the inner part, Rx, but we keep the square uh, kind of uh, uh, intact. This is the basic idea of, of the, the Gaussian using methods. And that's also the additional structure, think about it, that if you, in, in gradient method, you can only linearize the function itself, and then that's it. But now you get a square on top of it. So you, you solve this argument problem, you know, just, just automatic condition takes the derivative let it to zero, and this is like a highly underdetermined uh, problem. But you can take the, you know, the, the pseudo inverse, which is the minimum normal one, and then you got this, uh, this expression, in terms of uh, uh, R k. But if you express, we would like to go back, express in terms of F k because the R k is something like Dick T-shirt we created. Right, I mean, we but we want to see what is, in terms of original uh, function, if you use the relationship, you've got this. So the, the step size is basically the ratio between the uh, uh, function value over the norm of the gradients. So that's the adaptive step size we get out of from here. So, so it's really a, a great thing with a variable step size. And for people who have know the polyac step size, now it's clear that this is very similar to, to the polyac step size. The polyac step would corresponding to you have a subtract to f star on that, on that part. So, so it's very close. It's very close to polyac step size. And so this is basically polyac step size. Uh, not long ago, I guess Tao informed me that uh, you know. Professor Polyak has passed away this earlier this year. So that's one, you know, I, I, you know, I, I learned it from Tao and it was really sad because uh, there's so many important work he's done and we're still working, you know, <laughs> following lots of his uh, early works. But this Polyak step size is just one, you know, one, one small thing he has done <laughs> for himself, but, but it's really a big, uh, I think, uh, have a big impact. The idea, as you can see, is basically the ratio between the uh, function gap over the square norm of the gradients. And this actually you can derive it because uh, derive is basically you, if you write down the distance to uh, any of your point, x is plus one, you can of course substitute into the method and then you, 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 you open the squares, uh, you get this inner product term, use convex that you get this uh, uh, f the, the ob objective uh, gap. At, at that stage, you say, okay, I want to minimize uh, the right-hand side because it's upper bound by minimizing gamma k, and you will get that step size. So this is just like very uh, short uh, derivation. And it turns out it's, it's great. It's, uh, it's, a, it's called a universal uh, automatity. Basically, using this method, you don't have to care uh, what function class are you using? You trying to minimize? It could be have like simply convex bounded gradient. We have some kind of uh, uh, the best uh, convergence rate for this this type of algorithm is is one over k, and this can be achieved. And if you say smooth, you have different uh, convergence rate, and you have a, a strongly convex, a strongly convex, and a smooth. You have a kind of a geometric convergence, and the polyac steps that basically can can achieve everything uh, without knowing you know, what class it is. So that, that's great of its uh, adaptivity. So that's, but then the problem is of course is we need to know F star. And actually this is very important uh, because without knowing F star, so we just substitute and say, let's say zero is the lower bound of X star. 
but you can imagine that when, when it converges to, is, is contradictory in the sense that when the gradient converges to zero, which is optimality, if your numerator is not accurate, not zero, then you got an infinity there. So, so, so you will be instable. That's exactly demonstrated by this uh, uh, blue curves where this is a loss function. When you, when in the beginning is okay, once you close to optimal, optimal you, you will you know, oscillate wildly. And okay, the right one is the one that I'm gonna talk about, but let's, uh, we'll talk about it later. Uh, but just for the blue ones, is, that's also the step size. You can see that step size is basically, you know, you will oscillate, because you just don't know what the F star is. Is your exact consideration count? Yeah, consideration yeah. count, yeah. So there's, you know, that's, uh, uh, Lead to the question: is How do we modify the polyax step size to make it, you know, work? Uh, you can you can do a gradual tightening the lower bound. You can from like a zero, you can gradually tighten it towards the true lower bound. There's a, a ways to do it, but it's not very clean. You, you know, you need some more, uh, uh, lots of estimate. But there's simple ways. So one way is, is just clipping the step size. So say here we're given you know, the, 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 I would say the naive poly F step size without knowing the F star, just treating it as zero, and you just put an upper bound of sigma there. Then this is actually the equivalent so that your, your, the, the, the search direction, search step you do is by solving this uh, kind of uh, model based, you know, you have a piece of a linear, uh, you know, a model of the function. Or you can do a trust region. Trust region basically is this. If you do, uh, minimize this, you put a, a trust region. You see my, my step size cannot be larger than sigma, which you will actually end up with this rule. So there's different ways you can do uh, to stabilize uh, polyx type size. And yet another one is uh, uh, instead of hard constraint, you add a regularization on the V. And this is basically the uh, Levenberg uh, uh, Marquet method. And uh, this is actually the algorithm we're gonna focus on in this talk. So there's several different ways. Uh, yeah, we'll focus on the last one. Yeah, any questions? I'm confused between the, the, the two last ones. Yeah. It seems like the trust region you're saying, yeah, so the gamma K for the gas neutral stress region is the, well, that's just, sorry, yeah. Tightening. Yeah, I think we, we have not really looked into detail of this one. Yeah. Okay, so this is the one. Uh, if we put a regularization, you know, we have this Gauss-Newton idea of linearize it within a square, and then if we put on the regularization, quadratic regularization. Uh, in this case, we can, uh, again, solve with an uh, you know, automatic condition. In this case, because of regularization, you always get a, you know, unique solution. You have this inverse, and since this is rank one, you can write down the, the equation is basically uh, this. It's, it's a, I will, yeah, th this is a, just a, a simple solution, which is a scalar eventually, and does not involve F star, of course. Uh, but that's, yeah, that's, that's the one I, I right there. You got this, this gradient method with step size gamma, gamma K with, uh, in that form. And there are several properties. Is that the gamma k has you know, a range, lower bound, upper bound, by sigma and L, which is the smooth parameter you may not know. You don't know, but that does not matter. We don't need to know it. Uh, also, uh, you can write this one as a harmonic mean of uh, two kind of step size. One is this, uh, uh, constant step size sigma. Uh, the other one is basically the, uh, the other one is basically the, the you know, naive modification of poly step size, you know, just treat as a lower bound zero. So this is this one. And then you just take their harmonic mean. That, that's what is the, the step size is. Uh, yeah, you tend to go close to the smaller one of the two. So that's the that's intuition we got from here. Okay, we can try some numerical experiment. You know, on a 
simple convex quadratic function. And this time with f star equals zero, uh, we can try gradient descent is the green ones with, with you know, uh, step size. As we all know that if, if your step size is uh, larger than two over L, you can go, go unstable, go, you know. But if you apply this algorithm, it will not go to unstable. Although it's not going to converge, but it will never, never go unstable. And you will converge to some, some, some finite value, not instead. And also interesting, if you look at the step size, this is really the step size uh, of this one is actually, it's like line search. <laughs> it will just automatically go up. And you think it's too big and it will go down. Uh, close to this one, this is the one that actually converges. This one, for the one that's too big, for the ones that are larger than two over L, it will only convert to the two over L. It sounds like agile stability, you know, people will say safety learning, uh, but this is kind of a very interesting phenomenon. Yeah. Sorry, I'm confused. Why doesn't the, it doesn't, it looks like the gradient descent with A equals one over L doesn't converge? No, convert, this is actually this one. Oh, it's on top of the, okay. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, and also we can look at some you know, kind of logistic regression example on, uh, on some more kind of non-trivial data set. Uh, here again, you can see the loss function, uh, and this is actually the step size. Because it's really, you look at this, like a line search. If you have done line search numerically, this view like doing line search. And very interesting, very intuitive, this is basically a projection, uh, PCE projection onto a two-dimensional uh, space, which you can see visually what the algorithm does. So basically, for gradient descent, if you use a constant steps like gradient descent, this is only for one of them. I think it's for, for this one. Uh, the, the step size, you know, because of the constant step size, in your beginning, your step size is almost always too big. And it will just overshoot a lot. And then it will gradually work our way back to close to the optimal point. And the, this, basically, this is the first step. It's only here. So it's like an answer. It's a limit itself very carefully and then, then gradually moves to, to the optimal point in this way. So this is a quite different properties. Of course, uh, here's an immediate uh, question you may have uh, is uh, why not just doing land search? Yeah, land search is. Uh, doing something similar to this, and then, of course, can be better. Uh, yeah, but then the, let's come back to our goal is that we can apply the same thing to the uh, stochastic gradient case uh, directly, but you cannot extend the lancer at that point. Yeah, so this is just like a, a precursor of, uh, of the results. So yeah, I think this basically, the, the, the algorithm is basically a simple variable metric uh, kind of uh, step size, which uh, let's see improves upon the uh, naive multiplication of uh, polyx steps, but really do not know, need you know the uh, f star. And here's uh, some convergence result. Yeah, I think that, no the same algorithm the step size, and the let's see the assumptions are that it's mu strongly convex and the smooth. And here, uh, of course, we have something interesting. If, if, you're, if the sigma you specify happen to be less than one over L, you will just convert it to the optimal solution with the linear rate. That's best. And also, if, if, if your sigma specified is uh, much larger than one over L, two over L, but it's still less than one over mu, the strong convex parameter. And if your f star is zero, <laughs> then it can still linear conversion to your uh, other point. Uh, of course, then if, if f star is larger than zero, then uh, you know we have only linear conversion to a ball. For the convex case, is actually very is more interesting, is that. Again, here the, 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 we work with f, I guess, uh, average iterate x bar k, and you can see that the, the objective function it decays one over k, and with some uh, kind of a, a stationary error. 
when, if your sigma is less than one over two L, then, then we have a sublinear convergence of optimal value. No matter, uh, I think no matter if you F star larger than zero or not. So this is uh, interesting. And if, if F star uh, equals zero, then you, you, you have sublinear convergence of optimal value no matter how, how, how you set the sigma. It, it, you can be arbitrarily large. I mean, it's just like a converge. And they have some uh, intermediate cases where you still have inaccurate estimate of star, but then you have a uh, sublinear convergence of all. So those kind of things. Well, I think we do have also a, a kind of a non-convex case. Uh, in this case, we cannot have a sigma arbitrarily large. We will still, you know, less than two or L, you will get this kind of uh, uh, minimum uh, gradient norm squared convergence of uh, one over K. Okay, so that's, I think this is probably too quick cover of the theoretical uh, guarantees we have. Yeah, at this stage, uh, any questions? Uh, you know, I want to change the, the topic slightly next. So it's about the more generalized Gauss-Newton. Uh, so in this case, this is a more general version where fx can be expressed as the composition of h and c. Here, you know, h was uh, basically the square function before. And of course, naturally, this is a proximal linear algorithm. You, you again linearize c, the inner function, and then you add a regularization. That's how proximal linear algorithms do. Uh, but there's a question, what if H does not have simple proximal mappings. Basically, then, then this stuff may be uh, quite uh, complicated to do. In that case, you know, our idea is basically, okay, uh, you will treat, no, you will just treat this F as the ingredient is descent, but you have a second order term, like Newton even. But we're not gonna do Newton. We're gonna uh, actually approximate this part. Due to that particular structure, you have a, the composition. In this case here, I think this probably is the most uh, uh, messy <laughs> mathematics uh, of, of this talk. Is basically, you just do chain rule, you know, uh, separate the two. One part is, has the uh, hashing of the inner function. The other one has the you know, the second derivative or the second one we assume is a scalar function, h, so you have a second derivative. And then you have uh, the other product of the group. That's a typical Gauss-Newton kind of uh, decomposition. Are you assuming the smoothness of h? Uh, yeah. yeah, this is a smoothness. Uh, and then if you substitute this back to, in terms of f, you get the expression then you get that and then you get the expression then the, but here we have we do have you know the gradient we can calculate the gradient of f this is no problem but we, we cannot calculate the high, the second derivative that's why we approximate the first term basically by some some uh, identity uh, you know great, uh, diagonal identity so that's basically our best kind of effort of approximation at this stage but the thing is that we only just only requires the gradient. So if you work this out, then uh, basically you just solve this argument uh, with, with the hashing approximated by this, you will get this function. Basically the, your function is basically uh, have a Q here. Q X K is basically that ratio between the uh, second order, second derivative of the square of the first derivative. That's your Q. So in a sense, if you cannot compute, suppose H is a, a kind of a, a smooth, you cannot compute is a, let's say, proximal mapping. But you can compute is for second derivative, you know, scalar, and then you just take it, calculate the ratio and you put the ratio there. And so basically that's the, you know, rewriting everything so far. And now in the quadratic case, you can calculate if H is quadratic, you take the ratio, you got this uh, one over two fx, exactly the, what we have before. 
and you have a, like a monomial, you know, of piece order, p larger than one, you have a similar thing, but it's just like slightly changes the co coefficient of two. Uh, another interesting is that this, this one is actually very interesting because that's exactly the cross entropy loss. If you apply to deep learning, that's what you will have. Uh, of course, why the, the, this is a within zero and one. In this case, actually Q equals one. So that's a very interesting, this is just not, yeah, basically you have this, uh, the step size will be like proportional one over kind of a constant plus gradient norm square. Here's some interesting example compare with, uh, so one thing interesting at this stage is that up to here, the, in the beginning you, you have F and you can express it as a uh, square or square root, but if you also take the log of the exponential, right? some, something like this, if it's not negative. So you are feel free to, to use either the log or the uh, y. Actually the log here is natural if you use uh, like uh, uh, logistic loss. Well, in cross entropy, that's a natural, it's already in your formulation. And you can just uh, apply the, the same formula. It, in that case, if you take the square root is square, then that actually feels not very normal. You know, why would you take a log function, take the square of the square root, would that be a better idea? It turns out in this experiment, it is better. It's always better than the log one. If you stick with the log, you, like, you think you explore this problem structure because the problem has exactly the log there of the kind of a larger, that feels the right way to go. But it turns out it's not as good as you take the square of square root. That will beat that as we, we, we see in, in our, these kind of examples. Yeah, in this example, I think we have something uh, yeah, the blue ones are the ones with a uh, uh, square. The, 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 the orange ones are the ones with, uh, uh, let's say, uh, yeah, log, just using the log decomposition. And as you can see, when, when the parameters are good, they will converge, they all converge. But with, when the parameters are kind of a little bit large, the, the orange one can go unstable, can, can go also very largely, but the blue ones, the square ones, always stable. Yeah, so, so empirically, uh, square is always better than log, even on the log. <laughs> this is a little bit contradictory, uh, but I know, I have, I have some theory to explain it. So if you, we can discuss later if you're interested. I know why that's the case, uh, at least, you know, intuitively. Maybe even in theory, I can, I can explain it. Yeah, so that's, that's even for cross entropy loss. You, you still want to take the square or square root. Take the you square take, or square root. You want to transform it so that you have an H on the outside that's Y squared and then have something else on the inside? Or? Uh, no, basically, for example, uh, for the log Y, it's your original function. Yeah. You, can, you, can, you can just apply Gauss Newton, just negative log, you know, you linearize everything in the, in, in the inside, right? That's exactly. In the deep learning, you have uh, everything multiplying, you know, and then it goes through to some numbers, soft max, then you take a log, that's our last step, yeah. to get your uh, cross entropy. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, you can decouple the, you can decompose that uh, log with what the, the exact, you know, the, the formulation there. Yeah. That's the exact problem structure, and then you can apply this, because, uh, actually, the, the general Gauss Newton method to calculate the step size, this has worked. But for the, for the h y equals y square, you don't care. You see, you treat the cross entropy negative law, you treat it as a number. You know, you treat that as a function. Then by, you take the square root of it, and you take a square of the square root. Oh, okay. And then you apply it. That actually gave a better, more stable result. Yeah. If you were doing actual Gauss-Newton rather than using it to compute the step size, would you see the same result? Uh, I don't have any kind of empirical evidence, but, but uh, that's, that's definitely the, actually that's what we started to do in the beginning, of course, as you can imagine. <laughs> uh, the real Gauss-Newton with the multiple functions, you can have the matrix inverse. Yeah, I would discuss a little bit in the end of, the, in the extensions, yeah. Okay, now let's come back to the uh, stochastic uh, versions of this algorithm. 
again, now we we trying to minimize the kind of uh, finite average of a large number of functions. And then this is the basically the non negative Gaussian step size. Still, we, we pick you know a random index i of k at each each step k. That's the random index. You calculate the stochastic gradient, and the step size actually, well, no matter. You just take it whatever the that particular gradient. So it's it's, it's almost trivial. You can still write it as a harmonic mean of uh, the the constant versus a kind of. Uh, as a modified polyac step size. Uh, here, I guess, yeah, I will go through some boring, maybe uh, uh, theoretical results. Uh, one of the in interesting things here is that for lots of the uh, great adaptive gradient algorithm out there in the literature, uh, where you adapt the gamma k, <laughs> It's very hard to get a theoretical proof. Your result, saying your convergence risk is actually than, better than the classical SGD. You know, one over k. You just don't like Adam. The best proof of that. They are all kind of worse than the SGD convergence rate. But for this one, we can actually recover all the SGD convergence rate. Yeah. So there's definitions. Of course, uh, we have the you know, the argument of the whole problem. And we ha also have, uh, you know, the minimum kind of uh, function value of each, each fi. And we can have some kind of, uh, um, I almost forgot why we call it int. <laughs> yeah, I guess my course are calling the name. Uh, I was not agreeing. Uh, yeah, so the, the, the interpolation oh, Yeah, that's the interpolation. Okay, thank you. For, <laughs> for, for, you know, for each, uh, the optimal values, uh, the var basically the expected value of the automatic gap. And then you have this uh, pa pa position or, yeah. Yeah, average positivity. Okay, it's right in there. If it's zero, if, if if, if everyone is zero, and uh, of course the interpolation is if x star you know, is uh, minimized for all of them, then you got zero on the, on the first part. So this is basically the two definitions. And the possible scenarios, of course, both of them are larger than zero. For, for over parameterized model, you can see you know, both of them can be, can be zero. Uh, but, but all the other cases could, could be uh, possible in theory and in practice. This is actually rather messy. Uh, for convex functions, basically for, for, L, uh, for, for smooth convex functions, we can have some you know, one over k convergence with some, this basically the two, two deltas. As you can see, if these two deltas go to zero, we do recover all the SGD gradient one over k, even with uh, the, the adaptive uh, kind of step size. Uh, and if you, we can also change the sigma with some kind of a uh, one over square root k kind of a decay, or you can substitute maybe some uh, other uh, polynomial decay. You can you can show some uh, log log k factor. I think the difficulty in the proof is really that you know if you are familiar with the convergence proof or stochastic gradient method, it's really that the step size gamma k itself. It depends on the f, k, and the gradient the k. You have to be able to separate them to not actually affect the, the, the convergence. So uh, I think Antonio has came up some some quite interesting techniques I have not seen before. I was surprised uh, he, he you know he could dig up the certain very 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 interesting uh, proof techniques. If you were to increase the batch size, right? Yeah. The fi's as little batches instead of Singletons, can you show that delta int and delta pause also shrink as a result of that process? That you mean this one? Yeah. For for other yeah. step size, yeah, I guess uh, that in general that should be the in general you should have that. Yeah. 
that's getting up to uh, if there's like a dependence on the variance, so that if you increase the batch size, you can see the improvement in the rate. Yeah, that's pretty possible. We don't have a Yeah, we don't have the variance there. Well, you have that L, the, I think the L will decrease. So the LI smooth, so, so, that, yeah. so that, that constant will shrink, I think. Could we use batches? But that only kind of converted to certain, you know, certain uh, kind of level of smoothness. If you increase batch size, you, you expect a more smooth. Yeah. Uh, like the average of our lives, yeah. yeah, for that one, I, I don't remember how, how this kind of relates to the variance of the problem. Oh, yeah, I think this actually, this is translated. Oh, well, now I, I got it. So, this is basically covers some of the variance argument with LI in terms of uh, with the delta. If we go into the classical stochastic gradient method, we will not have this kind of thing. We'll just see the gradient uh, variance. But this, in the final case, we do this assumption, basically is reflected in there. Yeah, that, that's. Okay, for the, okay, here, here, here we go. Here we do have some uh, uh, gradient uh, variance. In, in the non-convex case, we'll still have this, uh, you know, the average of the squared gradient norm converges uh, one over k. Uh, with some, some, some noise term. Uh, yeah, actually the proof, the, for the, the pro in terms of proof, the non-convex proof is much easier than the convex case for, to, to figure out that converse, uh, convex rate is uh, pretty, uh, uh, requires a new technique. But this one I think relatively straightforward. Okay, now let's come to some, some numerical uh, experiment. A logistic regression uh, again. Uh, now we compare just SGD, you know, with, with constant steps, you can tune and which one constant size, steps. Of course, this is not a fair comparison almost because the SGD is not changing its gradient, but this is precisely show how much you can adapt, you know, uh, of this, this orange curve can adapt. This is a learning rate. As you can see, it's, it's kind of doing the line search. Uh, it stabilizes at a certain uh, kind of uh, range. And in terms of the projection, you can also say that it's make a much more a conservative moves kind of reach the other point instead of a, a constant step size. Of course, in the beginning, you always overshoot and then you, when the gradient becomes small, you eventually settles down. But this one is when the gradient is large, it will just automatically shrink step size, not to uh, step too far away. Uh, this is similar to the deterministic case. This one is actually the most interesting one. Uh, if you apply to this for ResNet 18 on the CFR10 data set, you can still do the same thing. You can try the green ones, you know, the just the different depth of color shows you try different constant step size. And the darker green is the one the best you can do. Of course, with uh, uh, stochastic and non-negative Gauss-Newton, if you just specify the sigma there, let it adapt, it can, be much better, you know, because this is the kind of the uh, training loss. This is a testing, I think, accuracy for classification problem. And look at the learning rate, the step size changes. It starts is like a very small, even though I think the set is uh, that this one is a, we can set is either three or 10, you know, three is the darkest value, I guess. And then it will just uh, start with small because that's kind of self-regular itself. And it will just increase and then decrease. This is the kind of idea form. If you train deep learning models, that's what you want. Uh, I guess this is uh, like a log horizontal axis. We just want to emphasize this, this part instead of the tail. Uh, yeah, this does kind of possess some really ideal property you would like to see in a, in a deep learning, uh, if you're tuning your step side. This is, this is uh, you, know, the, you know, the best behavior we want to, we, we, we expect. It's strikingly better than the previous example where they seem more interleaved, right? I feel like all your 
all the NGN ones here are just way better than the SGD, and there was like more interleaving in the previous case. It's very curious. Yeah, in this case, even the best ones are still the SGD, right? You can still tune the SGD to constant have a, to, to outperform, yeah. So it's not it's like this is guaranteed to be best in all situations, but it's first before this kind of a more, uh, I don't know, the, it's the reason of the ResNet model. Uh, but we can see, see more. We can see uh, do on the, uh, Larger model with a larger data set with image net. Uh, I guess it's not clear. Basically, this two side. This is a compare with uh, NGN with SGD with momentum. Uh, as you can see, uh, SGN, both are SGN. This is much better than if you fix uh, learning rate. Uh, I guess no. I guess in this we have this uh, this uh, kind of uh, uh, drop like cut of learning rate uh, on top of this all the of the kind of a adaptive algorithm. And here we compare with Adam. On, on, on the training, training data set, we convert it very similarly. And uh, the testing error, which is, no, I don't have it here, is actually slightly worse. So we, we do not beat Adam. So that's the key message. Uh, and also, I, another one we, we don't show is, is we, I guess I know they did experiment on transformers as well. It's, it's, it's started to become worse. The algorithm started to become insufficient compared with Adam. Of course, compared with SGD with momentum, other ones were still okay. But just Adam is a very uh, interesting one. Yeah. Um, so earlier you introduced the Q parameter, right? That depended on H. Yeah. Um, are you just assuming like H of Y is equal to Y squared in this case? Or yeah, we are all values? using the squared case. Did yeah. you ever compare it with any other function values for H, or are you, did you leave it as Y squared? Uh, we only use this. Uh, but we tried on the small ones, but I don't think we tried on the big ones within, using the logs. Uh, yeah. Because, because I, we think we know the reason why we shouldn't try that. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, we thought we know, but maybe still. <laughs> okay, now let's uh, just mention just one page of uh, extensions. Of course, as uh, Sasha mentioned in the beginning, you know the classical Gauss-Newton method or, or Lambert Marquardt is, is for a kind of a, a matrix variant. Basically, you, you, the top equation uh, looks like the same. But then, of course, you, you, you deal with the finite sum directly. And then you wouldn't get, from hindsight, the, the scalar one for, for each step size we substitute with the instantaneous function doesn't make, doesn't come from here. <laughs> yeah, but of course, you can, you generally you have a matrix. Uh, this is Gauss-Newton matrix. You can you take the inverse. And uh, there, uh, we have tried a little bit but the problem is that you know, we can try a, a block diagonal one, with, which would similar look similar to Adam, you know, but, but, but we have a square instead of square root. Uh, but this is also classical. And this, I think the classical uh, way for doing neural, neural network, if you go back to, the, I guess, in the 80s, 90s, people working on neural network, like, like Leon Boteau, they have clearly the Gauss-Newton method writing down to, to uh, train the neural network. The only difference is that they don't have this one here. So they, they just, you know, that's the classic, because this is the one you, using the Gauss-Newton trick, you will get the extra term there. And to make it really work, I guess, there's lots of uh, very practical things to do. You can only do a diagonal, uh, a block dot diagonal approximations. Okay, to summarize, uh, Basically, we started with, you know, uh, exploit the non-negativity to derive a adaptive step size rule. And it's interesting that this looks like actually a creative virtual structure to use, just, just to use the Gauss-Newton uh, trick. Uh, but surprisingly, it, it gave uh, some, some very interesting adaptive uh, algorithms. Uh, and it's, it's, 
has close connection to the poly that size. We can extend to the generalized Gaussian setting. And we have some uh, convergence theory that actually, especially the, in the stochastic case, in the adaptive stochastic case, we, we are able to get as good as uh, SGD convergence rate. As simultaneous, we have some you know, adaptive uh, stochastic uh, step size rules. Uh, currently, we are working, and that's still work in progress. Uh, we had a workshop paper in SML, but we still keep working on is uh, about momentum. You know, what, what is the picture if momentum uh, come into play? And uh, yeah, there's other ways we can, we can try to uh, change sigma in an in a, in a automatic way. So yeah, that's basically uh, all, all what I have. Thank you. So what is the intuition that square function is even better than the log even for the cross-entropy case? Okay, that's, a, that's an interesting one because if you look at a log function, because that gives you trouble because the log will have singularity, right? With, when it's close to zero, your gradient is gonna go to infinity, right? So you feel, oh, that's great, I captured that. You know, you know I captured that, that's a very singularity, so I should do better because the square don't care. Uh, but precisely that's the problem. Because if you think about the composition, you only get a half of it. <laughs> you get the log out. But what is in the composition is exponentials, right? <laughs> it's, it's, it's the soft max. So essentially, if you take the gradient of the overall function, it's a linear function. It, it, it does not grow up. It's, a, you know, it's, it's like a logistic regression. The, the gradient, the log, in the logistic regression, it does go to infinity, but it's compensated by the exponential. So if you want to take a structure, you have to take it both. If you take it both, then it become behaves like a quadratic or linear growth. So from that sense, you think about it, and if you apply the uh, uh, square root of the square, you basically, uh, let's say, make the slope of that uh, combined function even more, more flat. Yeah, you kind of take a square root. If you imagine, almost you take the uh, uh, condition numbers <laughs> by square root. That's the, 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 the intuition. So you want like the, whatever's inside the H to be as close to linear as possible. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, of course. If 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 the inside the is exactly linear, then you you actually doing the exactly the same the original function. Yeah, you don't have uh, approximations. Yeah, we, yeah, you, you, uh, okay, so you can use the polynomial with the higher order, but like monomials, for example, okay, piece order monomials larger than two, and then you can go up. That only slightly changes the uh, coefficient ahead of uh, the, uh, let's say the, we have the two in the formula, but it just changed that to p over p minus one. So, but, but yeah, we haven't done extensive uh, tests on that one. It, our brief experience shows that it's not um, gonna make any difference, or, or maybe not as good as this square one. Yeah. Okay, so how do you choose the sigma in the stochastic case if you wanna update it? Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's the old question. Of course, we don't answer. Uh, although I've practiced, one of the interesting things that as you can see, the experiment, we, we are free to choose some sigmas much larger and still, and it just, you no, know, it, it's, it's more stable. Even for the other question, that you, it's not as sensitive you could choose the learning rate directly for the SGD. Because if you choose sigma large, large you have this kind of, make it small, like attenuated by, by the normal square because it has the adaptive mechanism there. But we don't have like, uh, like the zoo, I showed you the zoo of learning rate in the beginning, that still is useful in practice. <laughs> because uh, if we want to make this all the kind of deep learning work, we, we still need a high level uh, 
linear schedule, uh, but maybe not kind of too careful. You just need a rough shape of it. It, it goes down eventually. Uh, Thanks so much, Dr. Like, uh, some of the examples you showed the step size stabilizes, but then like the ResNet, it doesn't stabilize. So do you have an intuition of when, when that happens? Which one? Like here, it's, it, you know, the step yeah. size oscillates. Yeah, that's that's. Uh, like in the other examples before, you showed where step size was actually stabilized. Yeah, I think that's also depends on the noise. I think all the other examples, but uh, well, this one also for the the one I showed the stabilized is actually the one that determining like single function minimization. It was stabilized. So this is a for for stochastic optimization always. Uh, yeah, yeah. But it's still not as bad, not as wild as. Yeah, yeah, but depending on the, your your batch size, how much you sample the the, the gradient, yeah. But for the simple logistic regression, I guess we have like a much less noise. We can sample a larger step size. I, I guess I'm curious how well you think the the idea will play with other extensions. Like you mentioned, you were going to try to combine it with momentum. Yeah. It seems like possibly you could also combine it with atom or you combine it with variance reduction or other things. If you think it's it's feasible, there's like a research program we can kind of supercharge the other methods using the the idea, or do you think it's like you know it's a competitor kind of thing? Okay, uh, first of all, combine with momentum is certainly interesting and almost always better in practice. The the reason is that the momentum, if you in stochastic optimization, most behaves like a low pass filter to, you know, you, as if you get a stochastic gradient which reduces the variance itself. And that's, that's kind of similar to the variance reduction things. Uh, yeah, so, so that's similar, but I wouldn't say it will be better if you construct explicit variance reduction uh, like uh, as variety type of things to compete with this one, maybe still better than momentum. That one I don't know. Uh, I think this year, I have a colleague in Fair who actually, okay, there's two words. One is like someone showed variance reduction doesn't work for deep learning or convex thing for, for non convex thing, but this year, <laughs> someone said had some you know new results say oh if you do it in a slightly different way actually is good. So that's all. Uh, to answer your question of uh, competing with Adam, I'm not very confident. <laughs> you know, this is a way to, you know, that's one of my current research topics is like to study why Adam is so good. Uh, we have a feeling that uh, this type of measure is hard to compete eventually. I mean, the, the, the corner wise uh, kind of uh, rescaling is very important. Very important deep learning. Yeah. So are you able to compose this with Adam? Like use Adam with this Gaussian idea inside somewhere? Or yeah, I, I would imagine you could, but at the end of the day, I doubt it will have much uh, added value. If if you tune the like the, especially the, the learning risk scheduling carefully as one of those cosine, all those kind of wrap uh, ups and cosine then probably will be as good as anything. Yeah. yeah. So why did people stop using Gauss Newton starting from the 80s? So, I mean, it's completely sort of, I'm just, I was just kind of curious. Um, so kind of everyone started doing SGT and so forth. And it seems like the end of Gauss Newton, if you're going to be careful, is still a good idea. I'm just curious about your thoughts. You mean the in, in stochastic optimization or, yeah. Yeah, even for, for neural networks. Yeah, for neural networks, I still think. I mean, I don't know. Especially the structure, like, they're essentially like kernel, kernel problems, right? So that's the linear systems we have to solve. So they're, they're not also bad. So I'm just sort of curious why it was entirely abandoned. Yeah, yeah that's, uh, that's interesting. Uh, as I just mentioned that the, the Gauss-Newton method, you know, if you look at Leon Bateau's kind of early papers on in the 90s, it's just like one of the first immediate step is after gradient descent is the Gauss-Newton. You can do exactly that version without the division by the FR, which is exactly the Gauss-Newton you would apply. Uh, 
But I think the, the reason is it, it's not pick up is that at least for the machine learning applications, problems, it does not provide enough advantage over stochastic gradient descent. And, and it's, it's even more kind of harder to, to, to compete with, with Adam. So that, that's, that's very interesting. Uh, yeah, we, I think, I think that one of the reasons is that Gus Newton is very much focused on the optimization side. Like, like curvature approximation, estimates the function value so close, that pretty much you know, the, the optimization axis. We suspect that Adam is doing something differently on the data side, on the, on, on the, on the statistic side. It's kind of weird, right? Because if you want an adaptive algorithm, there's classically only one way to make an adaptive algorithm, that's the second order information. Newton and the uh, Bayes Newton, like those are the most adaptive algorithms you can have. But that's when you have a, that's intuition works for the deterministic optimization. You have really large noise. If, you're, if the noise variance is much, much larger than, than the expected <laughs> gradient itself, then those intuition, they, they, you know, it's very hard to make them work. So that, that's my, my intuition. That's why you do some robust statistics like doing the sine or doing the clipped gradient. That actually will work better than what you do. What about for uh, saddle point problems? If you uh, you're like training like a, you know, training like a GAN, like yeah. does you thought about that at all using these Gauss methods? Not this one, but for, yeah, in general, again, is is a demon. Same thing. There, you are focusing on the curvature. I mean, you would tell me to go in saddle point. You want to, I don't know, you want to escape the saddle point, or you want to convert to the. It depends on what problem you solve. Uh, when you have a like, large amount of uh, noise, uh, lots of the classical intuitions about the uh, curvatures may not uh, work out. Yeah. That's my intuition. I don't have any concrete <laughs> theory to support that. Any last questions? If not, let's thank them again.